Well, good morning. What an exciting time it is to be part of the body here at Lancaster. So much going on, as you can tell by uh, announcements, and we're just thrilled to be able to announce this morning, in addition to our ministry team here of uh, Luke Skelton and his family, and uh, be looking for an, an email first of this week. Um, maybe with some ways you might be able to contact them and say welcome and let them know you're excited about them coming. Um, and uh, we're, we're looking forward to getting more time with them and, and what God has in store for the church here through their ministry. Um, but just uh, the several things that were mentioned that are, that are coming up, uh, it's nice to see activities being restored. Uh, to be looking forward to VBS, to be looking forward to Walk for Water. If you don't know about Walk for Water, if you're pretty new among us, uh, that is a great ministry and an opportunity to affect people across the world. We hope you'll be a part of that and several other things. A um, lot going on in the next several weeks here. Um, but, you know, when when... When the elders asked, asked me to come work with you, they told me that they wanted the church to be healthy and they wanted the church to grow. So here it comes. And sometimes when a lot's going on, uh, we can bump into each other. Don't be a porcupine. Be a nice person to bump into. We might... Some Sunday, run out of communion cups, uh, which I think we, maybe we did this morning. Just borrow someone else's. Uh, you might come in one day and somebody else is sitting in your seat because we don't have enough. Don't be a porcupine. Uh, be a spiritual amoeba. I don't know if that's the right analogy. I'm just making this up as I, as I go. But something nice to bump, bump up into. Lord is blessing us. He has great things in store for us. And aren't you excited? Let, let's see what, what's going to happen here. And we're looking forward to it. Thank you for being here today. One of the greatest dangers in our efforts to reach out. To reach out to the lost is the temptation to put on blinders. Well, you see an example of a of blinder here. You know what a blinder is. We put them on, on horses to keep them focused on what they're supposed to be focused on, you know, on the road ahead, not to be distracted by what might be happening to their right and to their left. But what works well for Horse navigation is a disaster for evangelism and outreach. If we put blinders on ourselves as Christians when it comes to outreach, we defeat our own efforts. And maybe that has happened to us more than, than we'd like to think. I want us today to notice the example of our Lord in a very famous story in Luke chapter 19. In Luke's gospel, Jesus here in 19 uh, is nearly to his goal of reaching Jerusalem and the cross. And so we've been following him as he's been making this journey. We've been following him since he set his face in that direction all the way back in chapter 9. At the beginning of, of Luke chapter 19, we meet Zacchaeus who uh, is famous for being the wee little man. And it's a great story for a lot of reasons. Children love the story. It's one of the first ones that we teach them in, in Bible school. And, and they love it not only because, um, you know, it's one of the first songs they learn, but because I think they really identify with being short and, uh, and trying to, to see through a crowd and fight through a crowd to see what's going on. And, and most children love to climb trees, so, you know, there's that too in the story. It doesn't hurt. But it's a great story for all of us 
and maybe for other reasons. Today I want us to look at it particularly from the perspective and from the example of Jesus. What do we learn about Jesus from this story? And do I behave like Jesus in relation to people like Zacchaeus? So let's refresh our memories and and read these 10 verses together at the beginning of the 19th chapter of Luke. He entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Let me pause the reading for a moment. Notice... Grumblers are anonymous. Luke doesn't tell us who this is. They grumbled when they saw it. And and grumblers often are anonymous. I'll just tell you, I don't believe in anonymous people. Anonymous people don't contribute to the growth of the kingdom. Real people do. And Jesus dealt with this. And so when they saw it, they all grumbled, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, if you look at the context of this passage, you realize that Jesus has recently come near the city of Jericho. At the end of chapter 18 of Luke, we we encountered uh, a blind man that Jesus, actually a couple of blind men, one in particular, that was outside the city, and Jesus restored his sight. Now in chapter 19, he enters the city, and it says that he's passing through. Now Jericho is an interesting place. Um, It's said of Jericho that it's the world's oldest city, the world's lowest city, and the world's hottest city. It's an oasis city down near the Dead Sea in Israel, really a beautiful place. And it was strategically important. It was situated along a major trade route from Jerusalem. And so it was a very profitable place for tax collection. To set up a tax collection agency in Jericho was a guarantee of worldly success. Zacchaeus is a tax collector. In fact, he was the chief tax collector for the region. So as a result, he is rich, very rich. He is also lonely, very lonely. Everyone hated him. He was an outcast. He was considered a traitor to his people, the Jews. He was also considered a crook, and most of all, he was considered a sinner and a bad one. Well, you know, all tax collectors at this time were considered sinners, and for many reasons. One was that they were looked on as collaborators with the oppressors, uh, the, the Romans, and they collected these taxes and then turned them over to the Roman governors. Sometimes 
They collected what they were supposed to collect, and then they would add quite a bit to it in order to bonus themselves and line their own pockets. Many Jews at the time thought it was wrong to pay taxes to the Romans, but they really couldn't do much about it. They thought it was wrong. And even if they didn't think it was wrong, all of them resented it, that they had to do it. Many of these tax collectors also became basically loan sharks. And so they would lend out money to people who were in desperate straits at very exorbitant rates. That, by the way, was direct violation of the law of Moses. And so tax collectors, as a group of people, were outcasts. And you can understand why. But as you read the Gospel of Luke, as you read Luke, you see something different. You know, the Jews would never have thought of including a tax collector in their circle of friends. That was unthinkable. And, and reaching out to a tax collector, no one would consider it. But look what happens in this gospel. In chapter 3, of Luke, verses 12 and 13. John the Baptist is preaching on this occasion. And he's calling people to repentance and baptism. And look who shows up out in the wilderness to listen to John preach. John chapter or Luke chapter 3, verse 12. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you're authorized to do. But just the fact that they were there. You go on just a little bit further in, in chapter 5 of Luke, uh, beginning at verse 27. Look who Jesus calls to be one of his closest followers. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Another amazing example. And imagine all the raised eyebrows at that dinner. And then just look at Luke chapter 18. One chapter back from where we are this morning, verse 9, Jesus tells a parable. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Here's the parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I, that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Question, who is the hero in that parable? The tax collector. Folks, Jesus is always challenging the common assumptions of the day. Then and now, 
So whenever you think about what the common assumptions of our time is, you can rest assured Jesus would be challenging that. He does it here. One of those common assumptions at this time was that tax collectors were hopelessly lost. They were unredeemable sinners. That was a blinder that they wore at that time. You can't save a tax collector. What are our blinders today? Can I suggest one or two? One is that we think that there are people who are too sinful to save. They're just, they're too ungodly, they're too immoral, they're too worldly. They, they don't even come into our line of evangelistic sight. We just automatically rule them out because they're so wicked. That's a blinder we put on ourselves, making assumption that Jesus would naturally challenge. Another blinder is that we, we might think that there are people, taking a cue from this story, that are too rich to save. That, that the wealthy would never be interested in the gospel or the church because they're so rich. And maybe even at the other end of the spectrum, we might say there are people that are just too desperately poor. But these are, these are blinders that keep us from reaching out to a part of our own community. In contrast to all of that, I want us to look at Jesus here in Luke 19. How does Jesus behave toward outsiders, toward sinners, toward the unsavable? How does he deal with a tax collector? In fact, the head honcho at the tax collection office, does Jesus wear blinders? Well, he, he creates this stir as he enters the city of Palms. People know about him. The crowds gather. Everybody wants to see him. As he passes through, even the rich guy, the chief tax collector, Zacchaeus. And, and as we well know, Zacchaeus was not able to see because he was so short. But notice what he does. He runs ahead of the crowds and finds a perch in a sycamore tree and awaits Jesus passing by so he can get a look. Let me ask you a simple question. Was Zacchaeus interested in Jesus? Obviously, he was a true seeker. He wanted to see the Lord. And you know, Jesus is always interested in those who are interested in him. He never turns down a true seeker. In fact, he searches for those who are searching for him. I wonder, folks, if there aren't more people looking for Jesus than we think there are. Could that be that they're more interested than we think? We won't consider them because they're too wicked or too much in this category or that category, whatever our blinders keeps us from. Can we tear our blinders off and see those we've missed? People out there straining for a look at Jesus. People we may have missed because we think they're too sinful or maybe they're too rich or too poor or too this or too that. People we assume would never, ever be interested in hearing about Jesus. Jesus in Luke 19 wears no blinders. Look at verse 5 again. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. How did Jesus know his name? Well, you say, because he's Jesus. He's the creator. Well, yes, of course. But 
Don't you think this shocked Zacchaeus a little bit? Jesus calling him out, calling his name like this. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For I must stay at your house today. Now Zacchaeus, because he was a true seeker, did exactly as Jesus said. He hurried and came down. He welcomed Jesus to his house with joy. But again, I want you to notice the reaction of this crowd full of people, apparently wearing blinders. They gasp. Stops them in their tracks. They can't believe what they are seeing, and they begin to grumble. He's hanging out with a sinner. Can you imagine going to that guy's house? Here he goes again. Can you hear them? You know what happens sometimes when sinners make a connection with Jesus? I've always had a hard time believing this, but it's true. But not this long enough to know it's true. Sometimes when sinners make a connection with Jesus, religious people grumble. All too often, some religious people are plenty comfortable with the way things are. And you start bringing sinners around, you start making things uncomfortable, and people grumble. That's sad. That's a tragedy. Especially in light of the last verse of this passage, verse 10. Don't forget verse 10. Jesus makes it very clear what his purpose is. What it was and what it is in this world. What does he say? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So in Jericho that day, Jesus was just doing what he had come into the world to do. And I believe that regularly we need to ask ourselves if we're here for the same purpose. Is that why we're here? We name ourselves after him, Christian. This was his purpose. Is this our purpose? Are we here to seek and save the lost? Is that what we're about? Are we willing to tear our blinders off and reach out to people that we haven't been looking at? Are we willing to be uncomfortable? And you can boil, I guess, all those questions down to one. Are we willing to follow Jesus? He's on the move, heading down the road. Are we, are we willing to follow him even if he takes us to Zacchaeus' house? Are we willing to go there? So the story closes with, with Zacchaeus showing that he was serious. He was really making a change. The law said uh, that if you steal from somebody, you had to give it back plus one-fifth. That was the law of Moses. Zacchaeus is going to do better than that, quite a bit better. He will give back four times anything he has stolen, he says. And on top of that, he's going to take half of everything he has. Remember who he is, no doubt a huge sum. He's going to give it to the poor. And Jesus says, as a result of, of the, this evidence of his heart, Zacchaeus, you're saved. Well, it's a great story. There is so much in it 
for us to learn from. But today I just ask you to keep your eyes on Jesus in this story. Learn from him. And then go do what he did. No one, no one is too sinful or too rich or too wicked or too outside of our comfort zone to be reached with the message of Jesus. Amen? I hope we believe that. I believe we do. And if, if we don't, keep looking at the Lord. He'll teach us. Thank you for listening this morning. This morning before we go, I sing this song to encourage you to think about your relationship with the Lord. Is it where it needs to be? Have you obeyed his gospel? Are you walking with him faithfully? If not, make a change today. Um, because he has promised he is coming. If we can be of assistance to you, won't you come while we stand and sing?